Uh, Buju. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, so glad that you're here today. This is the uh, 2017 uh, Michigan Indian Education Council's Native American Critical Issues Conference. So I'm very happy to welcome everybody to the conference. Uh, this is the first time it's been held in the Upper Peninsula in 17 years. So we're very excited to have it on our campus, and we have a lot uh, going on today. Uh, we had a good reception last evening and some good talks. Uh, we had the uh, uh, Michigan Tribal Education Directors met yesterday, and there was a really good meeting, productive. And then we actually had a uh, meeting last night on Native American higher education in Michigan, and that was very productive. So lots going on. Uh, we are going to have a prayer here. Uh, George Martin has uh, uh, agreed to say a blessing for us. He's going to come up, and, uh, and then we're going to have a couple drum songs and uh, with the uh, Morning Thunder drum. And I also want to uh, point out that we have the uh, Tribal Education Eagle Staff uh, that I carry on behalf of the Tribal Education Department's National Assembly here today. And so uh, if you all would, uh, after we uh, have our drums, or when we have our drum songs, if you could stand if you're able, and if you could remove your any headgear, that would be appreciated as well. And then, uh, and also during the prayer. Uh, we do have our uh, tribal chairperson from the Keweenaw Bay Indian community here today as well, Chris Schwartz. Schwartz. And if uh, Chris, if you would uh, come on up and uh, give us a few words, please. Miigwech. Thank you, Marty. And as Marty had said, my name is Chris Schwartz, and I'm, <coughs> pardon me, I'm the president for the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, and I'm honored to be here today uh, 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 to be part of this uh, critical if issues conference. Uh, and, and, and I'm glad you guys are talking about this and meeting about this because it's an important time to sit down and discuss uh, what, what concerns are with Native Americans. And on my way here this morning, I was just trying to think about what am I going to say when I get there in regards to Native American issues, you know. So I jotted down a couple of things that I thought uh, 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 you could discuss, if not, you know, that's okay with me too, because we're going up, up the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, we're gonna continue to push forward and, and, and address some of these issues that are concerning the community. And a couple of them uh, that rise to the top, so to speak, uh, and I've wrote them in no particular order to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, some of the things that we're dealing with at the Keweenaw Bay Indian community uh, is the prescription drugs, you know. The prescription drug abuse up there at the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, and I'm sure you guys are experiencing the same thing around here. It's not uh, 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 just Native Americans, it's all over, rural, urban America, you name it, uh, these issues are touching everybody. In addition to that, you know, there's some mascot issues here in, right in our hometown right here that we've got to deal with. Uh, the Marquette Redmen, uh, we are doing an ongoing discussion with uh, Richard Rossway, who is the uh, market area uh, school board president, I think. So uh, occasionally Rich will stop in and we'll, you know, sh uh, uh, sit around and discuss and have a dialogue about, you know, how can we address these mascot issues? And we're making some headway on it. We're not there yet, but we're making some headway on it. Um, clean air, clean water, uh, you know, clean air and clean water is all, all important to us. More importantly, it's uh, really important to the Keweenaw Bay Indian community because that reservation where we're living at was reserved for us for eternity. And it's really important to my community uh, to, uh, uh, to take on the responsibility to make sure that we've got clean air and clean water, not only for my generation, but for the next seven generations. And, and the reason why uh, we're, uh, uh, we want to have that clean water is because we just can't pick up and move. You know, these homelands were reserved for us for the rest of our lives. And if you think about it, 97 out of the 100% of water in the world, 90%, 97% of that water is salt water. 1% is above us, 1% is below us, and 1% is surface water. And about 22% of that 1% is right out our front door. So that's why it's really important that we keep an eye on the cumulative impacts that are happening with, with our Great Lakes and our fresh water supply. Uh, uh, we up there at the Keweenaw Bay Indian community think that water in, uh, in the next generation or so is going to be 
uh, worth more than gold. So uh, we are uh, very protective of the water. Uh, we are up there as we currently speak. Uh, we uh, are trying to uh, uh, increase our capacity at our natural resources department. So we have the capacity to take a look and regulate some of these things. But all of this comes with money and the great, the GLRI monies are really important to the Kewana Bay Indian community. And, 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 and if there's anything we could do here is, is write to our congressman and tell him how important to save the, those GLRI monies and to save the Great Lakes. Uh, also, thank you. Uh, a couple of other things I jotted down is the protection of treaty rights. That's always on our mind, the protection of treaty rights. Uh, also, what comes along with the protection of treaty rights is the obligation and the responsibility to use them in an appropriate manner also. So uh, uh, later on today, we're gonna go and meet, uh, our tribe is gonna meet another tribe in the Western United, or Western half of the UP, Lac du Desert, and we're gonna sit down amongst ourselves and talk some uh, about some critical issues uh, that we can probably sit down and talk and address, address in an intertribal manner. So this is the first time we've ever done that. So it's gonna be interesting. It's a big day for me. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you guys, you know, so. Uh, and just a couple other things, Health Care, Affordable Care Act, and of course, finally, the Indian Tuition Waiver. You know, we are always uh, uh, keeping our eye on the Indian Tuition Waiver. We do it here, not only here, we do it at a uh, number of consortiums that I belong to, United Tribes of Michigan. We are uh, all taking and keeping our eye on the Indian Tuition Waiver. And we want to not only retain the Indian Tuition Waiver, but we also want to make sure that it is fully funded. Th and, and that's important you know, because those schools that are going to bat for us, we got to make sure that they are fully funded too. So on behalf of the Kiwana Bay Indian community, I just want to uh, uh, thank you guys again for inviting me and chimigwich uh, uh, niu. Bring it back down to my level. Uh, miigwech to Chairman Schwartz. Uh, the generous support of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, and of course, Northern Michigan University, uh, all made this conference possible. And the presenters and the volunteers and the staff, I just can't thank everybody enough. And of course, the people who came uh, to the conference uh, to join us for this, uh, this very important uh, conference today. And so the, uh, uh, we're going to have a few words uh, from uh, this friend and elder uh, who has joined us here, and uh, George and I, we uh, talking about the tuition waiver. You know, back in the early 90s uh, when uh, Governor Angler was going to chop the waiver uh, for Michigan. He was gonna use his bully uh, veto power. And uh, we had a rally down in Mount Pleasant and Lansing. And I remember we were marching, uh, George and I, uh, George, he had uh, staff out there, and we marched from Central Michigan University over to the Mount Pleasant boarding school properties just to remind people that, you know, this is all treaty-based. And uh, la at our uh, Native American higher education uh, meeting last evening, uh, we said that we should have on November 1st of this year, uh, we're going to have a statewide event. Uh, it's going to be localized, and other people are going to do whatever they do in their community but we're going to celebrate 200 years of treaty education provisions in the state of Michigan. And so the University of Michigan, of course, is celebrating their 200th uh, year anniversary, but that university is created on tribal land, and in that treaty is an, a provision for education for the Anishinaabe, Sioux Fires Confederacy. We're gonna celebrate that. So I uh, really appreciate that idea. George, if you would, uh, please uh, come on up here and uh, share your wisdom and Good words with us. Miigwech. Babujo. Wadawa Nishikaz Deju Dan. My name is George Martin. I belong to the Lynx clan from the Ojibwe Nation. I'm originally from the Lequiri Reservation in Wisconsin, but I make my home down in southwest Michigan. And I was given same law this morning by to uh Talk to our creator on behalf of this conference and our people. 
So I'd like to thank our creator for this beautiful day that he's given us and thank him for that sunrise every morning, that sun that comes up over that horizon, that miracle that happens every morning. I want to thank him for that. We'd like to ask him to look down upon our elders, our elders who are here and our elders who wish they could be here with us but who are unable to make it. We'd like to ask our creator to watch over them. Ask him to look down upon our children and our young men and young women who are overseas to watch over them, bring them home safely and in one piece. Ask him to look down upon our mother, our mother the earth who is who is waking out of her sleep now, her rest, to, to do that job that she does every year to make sure that all her creations on her has clear water to drink and food to eat. And we want to thank her for that job that she does every year. And we want, and as Mishnabe people, we are here to help her do that job. And then we'd like to thank him for bringing you all here in a safe way. And when you leave here in those four different directions that you travel safely. And if you left loved ones at home, that you find them in good health. Be rich.
Uh, song we just sang, that's an Eagle Staff song. And that, uh, you know, when we're thinking about those Eagle Staffs, you know, that's our, uh, what we think of as the symbol of our sovereignty, our tribal sovereignty. And so when we have this Eagle Staff here uh, joining us at the conference today, you know, that shows our sovereignty in education. That's a symbol of the highest thought. You know, as those eagles fly way up into the sky world, you know, they carry our prayers with them. They carry our visions and our aspirations for the future. And so that's a real important uh, idea. Uh, we're going to sing one more song. Uh, this song is a Sema song. And this, this song was uh, gifted uh, to uh, Elder Jim Williams. Uh, it was a, you know, gift to him from his mom who had passed on. And so we'd ask no, uh, no pictures or any recordings for, for this song here. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech. 
Stretch Morning Thunder. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Rochelle Edwagizic, who is going to come up now, and we're going to have our general election for the Michigan Indian Education Council. Come on up, Rochelle. Bonjour, Annie. Mino Gijep, everyone. Um, as Marty said, I'm Rochelle Edewagijic. Um, I am Nimsky clan, and um, I'm from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, and it's good to be here. It's good to be in northern Michigan. It's just beautiful in the Upper Peninsula. We got a little bit of rain, but that's okay. Uh, and there may be a, a few little snowflakes in the air, but that's all right because we're, we're in Michigan. We're used to this kind of weather. We all got four-wheel drive, and I got my snow tires on, and I'm good to go. So, so it's it, it's a it's a good day, just like uh, George said. It's a good day to be Mishnabe. And um, I'm on the board of uh, this uh, MIEC, and uh, I've been. Uh, my committee has. Uh, has the honor of presenting the uh, slate of uh, board members. And as I say your name, would you please stand? Uh, we have some uh, board members that aren't here. They could not make it for a variety of, of reasons, but we, uh, we're here and uh, we're happy to be here. And I, the first person I'd like to stand is Marty Reinhardt. Yay, Marty. And uh, Marty, is our, Marty is our president. So he's done a good job. Here we are, and uh, thank you, Marty, very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, next, we have our vice president, which is Colin Church. Would you please stand? Where are you, Carlin? Colin? Oh, there you are! Yay! There he is. And uh, thank you, Colin. It's been uh, it's good to see you. Our vice our vice president. Uh, he he's come all this way to be with us. Um, Next, we have, uh, well, our board secretary, Jacqueline Lloyd. She could not be here today. She had other commitments, and she's very brokenhearted. I, I tell you, she really, really wanted to be here because she's put a lot of effort, along with Marty and his staff, to make this a really, really good uh, conference for all our participants. The next one we have is uh, uh, Emily Sirachi. She's over there. Emily. <laughs> And uh, she's been hard at work getting you all registered and keeping track of everybody and not let anybody slip in who are not supposed to be here. <laughs> so she's watching everything, and she's a hard worker. Boy, oh, boy, I don't know. we got to keep her. She better not go anyplace else. That's all i got to say. All right, and then um, we have uh, Conrad Church. He's not here today. He could not make it. I know he really, really wanted to because he's been on the board for several years. And he was our former president. Uh, next, we have uh, Frank Edewagijic. And uh, he's not here right now, but he will be here. I've been charged with picking him up at the uh, airport this evening, so i got to go over there and pick him up. But he's, he's en route from Washington, D.C. And he was attending, I think, along with Chris Schwartz, the uh, uh, mass meeting, which is uh, Midwest Alliance of Tri uh, Sovereign Tribes. So what they do is they go to the Capitol and try to uh, um, uh, lobby, I guess is a good word, for our rights, the things that keep us sovereign. Well, we're sovereign, but there's certain issues that we need to always, as Chris has said, we always need to keep out there, not let them forget we, we're here and we're going to be here forever. Okay. And, of course, Rochelle, it would be better with myself. I'm here. And, uh, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> It's good. It's good to get an applause. Uh, next, we have June Magnagoma Fletcher, and unfortunately, she has had some sad things happen in her life. Uh, her partner, um, her husband, walked on, so she's taking a little bit of a, a leave of absence right now. So she's our next, and she's been a longtime board member. Okay, next we have uh, Melinda Hernandez. Would you please stand, Melinda? Oh, there she is. And uh, Melinda has, is really 
interested in the areas of education. She's right there on, on our committee to make sure that those issues that are pertain to education are right in the forefront. Next, we have Daniel Coda, and I don't know if Daniel is here right now. Is, is Daniel, I know he's in route too, so. Okay, well, Daniel, will, he's here. <laughs> well, I guess he, he slipped out on me. All right, um, and then uh, we have uh, Sharon Coda, and Sharon Coda unfortunately could not be here as well. So um, after that, we have Dylan Miner. There he is. And uh, Dylan is a wonderful artist. You can see his artistry uh, in that lovely vest. I mean, somebody wanted to grab it already this morning. So, <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Dylan. And he, uh, his artistry is just fantastic. He's known all over, all over the country, and he puts on exhibits. He's just fantastic. Um, next, we have Judy Penn. And Judy, oh, there she is. There's Judy. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. She is uh, with the Zeebling, and we've held uh, a couple conferences at Zeebling so far, and she's right there har working hard to make sure we have a good, good conference. And then we have uh, Emily Proctor. And Emily is, uh, sh I know she wanted to be here. I think she's coming up tomorrow. She'll be here tomorrow. And um, Emily Proctor was just elected on our tribal council at Little Traverse Bay Band. So um, she will be leaving our, um, our uh, board. So she is not going to re-up this year because her responsibilities of being on the tribal council. Um, and she's new on that, so she has decided that she can, uh, needs to take care of uh, those issues at home. And um, also, we have, uh, since that will leave us a vacancy on our board, so the, um, the tribal directors of um, Michigan have, uh, we've asked them to, if they would mind uh, recommending someone for our board, and so that recommendation is uh, Sam Morsaw. And would you please stand? Oh, there he is. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. And uh, he's the uh, education director of the Pokagon Band. And um, so um, thank you very much for uh, serve, uh, offering to serve on our board because we need those connections all over the state. Thank you so very much. So I would like to put in motion the new um, this year's board of uh, MIEC. And if I could get a second. OK, well, all right, we have uh, a second from Dylan and Marty, too. He's, he's, he's right in there. He wants to make sure this is running good. And it is so far. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 OK, any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carried, and you have your new slate of board of directors. Thank you very much. Okay, and so as a uh, gift to the new board, we have a, a business meeting this evening at 515. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, so I'd like to uh, welcome up to the podium uh, Dr. Jessica Cruz. Jessica Cruz. Oh, there she is. <laughs> she was hiding. <laughs> I just overlooked her. All right. Uh, so Jessica is going to give us a welcome on behalf of Northern Michigan University. I got to copy Marty. <laughs> so my joke is usually five feet even and proud, right? I'm sure some of you here have heard that many, many times. Uh, well, buju ali, buenos dias, good morning, everyone. As Marty mentioned, my name is Jessica Cruz. I am, well, the lead diversity and inclusion officer here. I'll use that title today. I'll tell you the background story later. Um, last year at the powwow, I gave some remarks as a new member to the community. I was beginning my position here on, on February 1st, and I'd like to read some of that with or share some of that with you today. I have it here in writing uh, because it's a good way, I think, for folks to to know who I am and where I come from and kind of honor that on, on my end. So I'd like to share that with you now um, in my native language, which is Spanish. So, es mi honor darles la bienvenida a Northern Michigan University, universidad localizada en la tierra central del pueblo indígena Anishinaabe, como saben ustedes. 
Quiero también honrar a los miembros indígenas de nuestra comunidad, especialmente a mis mayores. Este, también quiero tomar un momento para honrar a mis, a mis antepasados. Me llamo Jessica Cruz, soy nieta de Cecilia Santos Santiago, de José Cruz Quiñones y soy hija de Norma Cecilia Cruz Santos. Somos de Yauco, Puerto Rico, capital indígena del pueblo taíno de Borinque, nombre de antes que el contacto. Conocido por el río Coayuco, el nombre Yauco proviene de la palabra taína Coayu o yuca. So, now I'll repeat in English. Uh, it is my honor to welcome you all to Northern Michigan University, of course, located on the beautiful ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe people. Uh, it's wonderful to be here to honor all of our indigenous members of our community here, especially our elders. So I wanted to also begin by taking a moment to honor my ancestors and my elders. So my name is Jessica Cruz. I'm the granddaughter of Jose Cruz Quiñones and the granddaughter of Cecilia Santos Santiago, daughter of Norma Cecilia Cruz Santos. We come from Yauco, Puerto Rico, which is the indigenous capital of, of of the Taino Nation in Borinque. Uh, it's pre-contact name, right? It's known for its river, Coayuco, uh, um, and the name Yauco means, it's actually a Taino word for Coayu, or Yuca, which is, of course, now in Spanish, and that's a translation in English as well. So you've uh, heard me talk several times about Yuca here, and those of you who work here in Northern Michigan University, when I first got here, the Decolonize Your Cookbook project was going on. I went over to the library and there was these, these banners and I couldn't believe that I come up here. I'm from Yauco, Puerto Rico, and I come up here to Marquette and I find all these discussions around yuca. It was just such a beautiful connection for me to experience both on a personal and a very professional level. So thank you for that. So again, I'm honored to be here on behalf of Pedro Nixon. Welcome you to Northern Michigan University um, and of course to the 2017 Native American Critical Issues Conference. The theme of this year's conference is, of course, uh, traditional knowledge, uh, rebuilding our traditional knowledge systems, which I believe captures much of the work that we're doing here at Northern. I'm very proud of our Center for Native American Studies. This is one of the reasons I was excited to accept this position last year and to come here. Um, of course, they established the first and only Native American Studies major here in the state of Michigan, and they, s yeah. <laughs> And this past December, we had a beautiful, beautiful commencement ceremony. Marty was our keynote speaker. Rachel, who's here in the room, was one of the first graduates. Shout out to Rachel. You want to stand real quick and get in? There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Trevor was also one of them, and Caitlin. I don't know if Caitlin is around. But those are the three graduates, as I understand it. It was a beautiful, beautiful ceremony. Um, and last year was also the first spring break warriors trip. Um, and so the Center for Native Studies, Native American Student Association, and the other orgs went on a tour around the UP to promote the new major. Uh, I was brand new. They asked me for support, and I said, yeah, but can I come? So I joined them. <laughs> I love this story. I share it every time, and it never gets old. I love it. Um, I was completely lost, had no idea where I was, um, had never really spent too much time in the UP, but I joined them. April and I roomed together. <laughs> It was a fantastic experience, and to me, I felt like I was welcomed into a new family, a new home, a new community. So I wanted to say miigwech for that. It's something that I, that I hold very dearly, a memory that I cherish, and I wanted to thank you for that publicly. Um, this year, the group again went on their trip. Um, I want to say there's a couple folks here that went with them. April, of course, went again. Judd, uh, Gabby, you went last year. Whoever went just stands. How about that? <laughs> last year or this year. Let's give them another round of applause for keeping that going. And this year, they also promoted a new project that we have going on that you've heard about already from Marty yesterday and that you'll hear more about later today, twice from April and from Marty, and that is our NSF Includes project, which is Indigenous Women Working in the Sciences. This is probably my favorite or is my favorite project to work on in everything that I do. Um, we are reimagining STEM, right? So again, if we're rebuilding our traditional knowledge system, this is a perfect example of how we embody that work here at Northern. Um, so we have two summer programs coming up this summer. Uh, one is the Educators Institute in which K-20 educators um, can come and enroll in a one week long course, get two credits and learn how to incorporate or how to teach STEM and science specifically from an indigenous epistemology. Same with students, 10 through, 10 through 12th graders. We'll, we have slots for uh, 48 students. For the educators, it's 40. So again, 48 uh, spots available for 10 through 12 students. 
and they will have a two week long program, one week here on campus, one week at Camp Nesbitt, which I love because it has no cell phone signal. So that's on my calendar and I am I'm there um, and everything is covered. Right. So, again, it's all about reimagining STEM and understanding STEM and science and promoting that knowledge from our indigenous epistemology. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful project. So I'm very excited to be on this journey with you all. Um, happy to be here again. Um, and lastly, as we prepare for today's conference, I just want to give a shout out on behalf of Northern University, Northern Michigan University to thank everybody for putting together this conference. I know it takes the words of a community. It's a collective effort. I don't know everyone's names that was a part of it, so I just want to give a general thank you and miigwech. So welcome everybody to, to our conference. Have a fantastic, beautiful day, and thank you for letting me share sh a few words with you today. Chi miigwech. Okay, and I would like to uh, now welcome up to the podium uh, April Lindela, who is the director of the Center for Native American Studies. And uh, April will be introducing our keynote speaker. And uh, I appreciate your patience because our conference schedule always gets off a little bit. That's okay. We'll have time to go to the bathroom and get ready for our session, so no, no problem. April? I'm one that if I'm standing behind the podium, they're like, stand up. Stand up. Okay, so I'm just going to move to the side here. Bonjour, mon ami Jacob. It's very, very much an honor for me here at NMU to host everyone to this Michigan Indian Education Council's Critical Issues Conference. Um, we're really delighted and tickled because so many, we've heard some of the blessings that we've had over this last year that we're so grateful for. Um, and, and this just really adds to that list of things that we're just really proud to be a part of and proud to put our name on. Uh, to say that you know we could be coming together as educators, as people of the community to address issues for uh, not only our folks today, but for our, our generations to come. Uh, so it's also an honor for me. I had an opportunity to uh, meet our guest speaker last night, picking her up from the airport. I might add, uh, when Sonia and I went to go pick her up, uh, she was wearing flip-flops. <laughs> and Sonia says, oh my gosh, maybe she should have some socks or slippers or something. And, we, and I'm like, she's from Alaska. She's hardcore, <laughs> so we're okay. <coughs> In this talk, Dr. Malia Villegas, uh, her talk is entitled Flipping the Script, Using Data to Tell Our Stories in a Good Way. She will share insights from her work at the National Congress of American Indians Policy Research Center to use data in innovative ways to uplift our children and families and celebrate our cultures. Dr. Villegas will highlight policy recommendations, data techniques, and examples from communities and systems using data to improve people's experiences. She served as the director of the NCAI Policy Research Center from 2011 to 2016. She recently transitioned to work for her Alaska Native Village Corporation, a Fognac Native Corporation, to serve as the vice president of corporate affairs in order to help establish a community sustainability framework. Dr. Villegas has extensive experience in tribal research governance and led projects on building, um, building tribal data capacity, improving the transition of diabetes research. I know many of us are worried about that. Strengthening the dissemination of community-based participatory research and fostering native youth resilience. She serves on the editorial board of the Journal of the American Indian Education and previously served as an editor of the Harvard Educational Review and Dr. Villegas has earned her master's degree and doctorate in culture, communities, and education at Harvard University and completed her undergraduate studies at Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Malia Villegas to the stage here. Chamai waka ani buju aloha mai. Good morning, everyone. It is such an honor to be with you. And I'll say that uh, I wasn't quite sure who to look for uh, off the plane. And I thought, okay, I don't know. I, I know her name is April. And I didn't have any trouble finding April and saw her in these beautiful brown smiling faces. <laughs> Felt like two sisters and just coming home. So Koyana, thank you. And Marty, he checked on us on the way uh, in from the airport. You got her. We got her. All right. So <laughs> it felt like 
coming home. So I just really appreciate the hospitality, the welcome. It's just a real honor to be here. First time in Marquette. I want to definitely uh, thank the Keweenaw Bay Indian community to welcome this morning. Uh, wonderful to hear some of the priorities that we're hearing all around Indian country. So clear on in. Thank you for that. Also want to acknowledge the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe for their sponsorship and welcome, and the Sault Ste. Marie uh, Tribe of Chippewa Indians. I've worked very closely with Chairperson Aaron, Aaron Payment, Larry Jacques over the years around tribal data uh, pieces. So it's an honor to be here. I see Colin, I see Rochelle, uh, a lot of friends from the National Congress of American Indians community. So thank you, folks. Um, I want to start um, by saying that I'm a native nerd. Are there any other native nerds in the audience? All right. Pointy heads, geeks, data people, right? We have always been scientists. We have always been scientists. And now that I'm in the business space, I like to say that we have always been innovators and entrepreneurs. This is our space. I remember uh, visiting, I did some of my work in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, Dr. Linda Tuhiwai Smith, who wrote Decolonizing Methodologies. And I was talking with her one day and just watching how she moved around the university space. And I said, Dr. Linda, you just move with such ease, and I just struggle so much in these institutions. How do you do it? And without hesitation, she just said, what do you mean, Malia? These are our institutions. They're built on our lands by our people's hands. These are our places. These are not foreign entities. And so I always like to start by claiming that these are our spaces. This is our knowledge. This is our, this is our space together in this context. At the same time that I'm a nerd, I'm a pointy head, I'm a geek. I'm also a dreamer. I like to spend a lot of time in the clouds, a lot of time on the mountains, visioning and thinking where do we take our work going forward. And so when Marty invited me and he told me a little bit about uh, MIEC, I said, you know what, I think I might be able to find a few of my people there, uh, dreamers and nerds. So that's really what I want to invite you on this uh, journey with me this morning. And thank you for your time. I know it's time away from your families and your own your own uh, commitments there. So the question that I really want to frame um, for you today and, and for you to think and dream with me around is what is our work together as a community of educators? And in framing that and thinking with you to together about what our work is, I wanted to share some of the dreams that I've learned and, and been shared with across my journey in the hopes that they might inspire your dreaming over the course of this conference together. As educators, we have a particular responsibility to keep dreaming for and with our communities, right? We occupy the dream space. This is some of our work together because we are called to link generations. That is some of our work between our elders, our adults, our young people coming forward. That is some of our work as educators. We also must constantly broker cultural differences, right? That is some of the work that we do as educators, whether it be across gender, across age, across language. This is some of that work and why we occupy that dream space. But we also work in the realm of the mind, the body, and the spirit, where those converge in our places. And that is some of that context. As an example of this beautiful dance that educators must do, I'm reminded of one of my favorite dreamers, Dr. Gregory Cajete. Has anybody heard of Dr. Greg's work? Yeah, Native Science is one of his many volumes. One of my favorites is one of his earlier pieces called Look to the Mountain. I mentioned I'm a mountain a gazer. And in uh, Look to the Mountain, he poses a question, where does the mind live in the body, right? In Western culture, we often think, brain, right? Our mind is in our brain. And in other indigenous cultures, particularly Maori, uh, the head is uh, considered very uh, tapu or sacred. And so the connection to spirit is there as well. So it's not just a Western concept. But in other places, the mind lives in the pitu or the pito, the belly, thinking about our connection to our, uh, our mothers in terms of the umbilical connection, right? And thinking of as women, our next generation, our umbilical connection. So the belly, uh, listening to your gut, right? That idea that our mind might live elsewhere from our head, our brain. Greg uh, and his people in the New Mexico and the desert region talk about the feet as being particularly significant and connecting us to the land, connecting us to the earth, connecting us to the water. I know when I get to the beach, first place I go is put my toes 
in the water, right, in the sand, and you feel that connection. So as we begin to think as a community about what is our work together, this notion of where the mind lives in the body is very significant, and also keeping connected to our bodies in terms of our health. I went through a pretty major health situation, and you can kind of hear my, uh, my frogs joining me this morning, um, but I had disconnected from the work of keeping myself healthy, and I was reminded by dear community friends, you have to bring those two things together. So I want to hold up a bit of a mirror to you today to say thank you for the work that you're doing, but to also encourage you as brothers and sisters to help keep each other healthy on this journey because we need you. We need you to be doing this healing work, but as healers in the education path, you got to take care of yourselves as well in this, and I'm saying that to myself as well in this space. So thinking about where does the mind live in the body, our understandings of where knowledge come from help guide our sense of who we are, ourselves, and our sense of what we're responsible for, what our roles are, what our calling is. That's that frame that I want to fr frame out for you today in terms of thinking about what is our work, what are we called to do. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, we started a project up in Alaska uh, where we I wanted to try to understand more about what Alaska Native student success was. I was a student at the time trying to learn and understand what uh, our perspectives, and so I did a whole literature review, and what I found in the research was that it was focused on making schools and systems more effective, but it lost a lot of touch with what was going on for our kids and our families. And so in sitting down with elders, with students and families, with uh, culture bearers, one of the things that I heard from them when I said, what is Alaska Native student success to you, was it's not so much about school success and making schools more effective, but it's about role-centered success. How do we help our kids first and foremost know that each one of them has a particular gift uh, and a sense of who they are and building that space, but then helping them understand what their roles and responsibilities in community are and then a third layer about uh, a lot of our cosmologies in Alaska talk about what it means to be a good human being. So not just our roles and relationships to human community, but what our roles and responsibilities are to plant, animal, and spirit. So it was a whole different framework about how we develop our children to understand their roles and responsibilities in that context. So moving from there, um, what I really want to share with you is this idea of big grand goals, dreams, right? What are the dreams that I've come across and how can you and how can we set a big grand goal for Indian education from your region and beyond? A couple of the goals, the big grand goals I've come across in my time, uh, the Center for American Progress or CAP set an interesting goal about five years ago called Half in 10. Has anybody heard about the Half in 10 campaign? Couple. It's a kind of an interesting framing. Their idea was to half the poverty rate in 10 years time. Pretty grand goal, right? And they had a couple of urban areas in particular, but we were working with them around rural uh, poverty. And while they haven't gotten there, it galvanized a movement around how we understand the realities for family and children. So setting a big grand goal like half in 10 really moved people to think different ways. In 1980s in Australia, where I was able to spend a little bit of my time in my postdoc space, they set a goal of producing 1,000 Aboriginal teachers nationwide, and they hit that goal, and it transformed the nature of Aboriginal education, and I believe created the opportunity for me 30 years later to actually travel there, and they uh, had started uh, the first national Indigenous education reform movement right around 2010 to change the culture of schooling for Aboriginal children, but that movement was seeded by setting a big grand goal of graduating a thousand Aboriginal teachers. Big grand goal. A uh, dear friend of mine, uh, Janie Hip, who used to work at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, started a uh, program called the Indigenous Ag and Food Institute at the uh, University of Arkansas College of Law. Only College of Law with a native dean, Stacy Leeds, who's brilliant. This, this team uh, of women's powerhouse, they set a goal of, grad of producing Indian country's next food producers. So they've had three cohorts so far of high school students who are raising bison uh, herds, who are learning from Walmart and Tyson's Chicken about food distribution. They have the data to suggest we can feed each other 
as Indian country, but our distribution process is flawed. So they are working with our very young to generate the next food producers for Indian country. A big, grand goal, right? Powerful. In Alaska, we set a goal in the 80s to infuse Alaska Native knowledge into K-12 science and math curriculum. We got generous funding from the National Science Foundation to create what's called the Alaska Rural Systemic Initiative. The only way that this happened, though, that this was successful and fed into Alaska cultural standards, which has had informed state standards for indigenous education throughout the U.S., was by uh, com communities of native teachers in different regions of Alaska coming together to bring indigenous knowledge together with a K-12 curriculum in that sense. So again, galvanizing through some of these big grand goals. Stephanie Freiberg, Dr. Freiberg, is a Tulalip scholar. She's a dear friend of mine out of University of Washington. And she spent some time with her Indian Child Welfare uh, program there at Tulalip. Also ended up uh, fostering and adopting two, two uh, community children there. And they set a goal around developing trauma-informed early childhood settings that celebrate a growth mindset. So not only healing for the children, but trying to expand and build a different kind of schooling system. They're now partnering with Pueblos down in New Mexico to build more trauma-informed care beyond. One of my favorites, the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Coalition. It's not a test. I have to know these names. You don't necessarily. A group of 68 tribal communities along the Yukon River, which spans Alaska all the way up to Canada. Can you imagine 68 tribal communities getting together to make one goal? And their goal is to be able to drink from the Yukon River powerful, right? You talked about water this morning, to drink from the Yukon River. This is a big grand goal and it has galvanized how they take responsibility for themselves and for each other in that context. And the last one I'll highlight uh, several communities here as well. Um, I know to provide our children the opportunity to be educated in our indigenous language, no matter what level of education they want to pursue, right? Maori, Hawaiian, we see it in this region as well to be able to build that. And so that's really the goal that I chased as part of my doctorate uh, work. I went over to Aotearoa, New Zealand to study their effort to graduate 500 Maori PhDs in five years. 500 in five years, which they not only achieved, they superseded. By my count, it was 732 Maori PhDs in five years. Un unbelievable numbers here. I wanted to know why. Why would an indigenous community invest in PhD development? Was it a leadership development model? Did they want to take over the universities? And who were these PhD students? Let me do a little quiz because I like data here. I'll tell you the trend is the same as we see in voting patterns in Indian country. So how many of you think of these 732 Maori PhDs that more were men, were Maori men? Nobody. How many of you think 732 more of them were Maori women? Interesting, interesting, okay? Typically with PhD students, the entry age is between 25 and 40, right? So, um, and then there's 40 to 60 and 60 plus in terms of age. How many of you think that the, the average uh, Maori um, uh, entering and graduate was between the ages of 25 and 40? Kind of the typical mainstream Okay, how many of you think between 40 and 60? Okay, a little more. And how many of you think 60 plus? Okay, not too many. I will tell you, I uh, spent some amazing time with an 85-year-old Maori woman who got her PhD. Brilliant, brilliant woman. So by and large, they were Maori uh, women, uh, and they were in the 40 to 60-year-old uh, range. So these are the mamas and the grandmas, average age 51. And by and large, they were not entering in the PhD path to pursue a professor role, right, to become a faculty member. They, many of them, and some of them were, but you can imagine the market couldn't absorb 732 new, uh, you know, graduates in that period of time. They wanted to inspire the children and grandchildren they were raising to continue and to pursue their education. This was a community transformation, a community commitment to education here, and typically in educational transformation, it takes 25 years to see an increase in educational attainment in a population. In New Zealand over this period of time, they shrunk that to eight years. So you were seeing mamas and sons graduating in the same graduation ceremony, grandma, grandfathers and grandsons in the same, granddaughters going forward together. 
they called it um, tuakanatena, which uh, I interpreted and learned uh, is a push me, pull you kind of approach. So at the same time I'm pulling you up behind me, I'm being pulled up by the next generation. It's a genealogical uh, connected kind of piece here. So the idea is that the dreamers, they, they led this community transformation because this movement was seeded by an earlier movement uh, called Kohangareo, which was the language nest, where a group, Linda Smith, who I mentioned earlier, and her husband, Graham uh, Hingangaroa Smith, had a daughter, and they wanted her to be able to have her preschool education in Maori language. But then she kept getting older, right? Oh, well, we, we, we need kindergarten in language. Oh, now we need first grade, second grade, all the way up. And uh, 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 she didn't want to stop. She went all the way to get her PhD. So as she and others are moving through education, they had to build the system to uh, give them that experience. And then you begin to see more and more moving through. So that those dreamers, that dream of providing that space for their young daughter turned into a whole community movement that has inspired so many others. First Nations communities, Graham went to Canada and said, all right, let's set a goal of 250 First Nations PhDs. They're close. They're getting real, real close there. And then he came to our communities and said, we want you guys to set a goal of 100 Alaska Native PhDs. I'm number 41, and last count I think we're at 85. So we're getting very close to this kind of dream. And yet there are some things that are stifling our dreams, right? I, I'm not in, in the clouds too much to, to realize that there, we do have barriers. And so as we think about what is our work together, I just want to talk about a couple of those pieces. One is a, a concept um, that I learned in the diabetes work that I was doing around fatalism. I had an opportunity to talk to some Native youth about their um, healthy eating and healthy uh, exercise uh, habits. And a few of them said, you know, it doesn't really matter what I do. I'm Native. I'm going to get diabetes. This idea that genetically, that our genetics determine what our life course is and how do we begin to change that. The, I've heard this conversation in cancer realms as well. I come from a region where we experienced one of the worst oil spills, Exxon Valdez. Our elders are, you know, they want to continue eating our fish, and yet we, we have these cancer rates. And how do we continue to practice our traditional ways and yet avoid these horrible health uh, issues? I've heard it in an addiction context. I'm Native. This is just what my life is going to be. We have to actively work against the fatalism because that will stifle and, and just really end our dreams in that kind of context. That fatalism is fed by stories that frame us as broken. We heard about mascots this morning a bit, right? And when I worked at NCAI, we would constantly be getting these, why are you guys wasting your time talking about the Washington football team? Like, you know, there's bigger issues. There are bigger issues in Indian country. But when you see these young people come to the nation's capital for the first time, so excited to be in Washington, D.C., and someone passes with that mascot and say, on their shirt, usually at the National Museum of the American Indian of all places, you see their hope and you see just the confusion set in about, is this who represents us at, at, at our nation's capital? So this idea about the images and representation and stories that we tell each other are really fundamental. Any education policy report you go into, you're going to see the gap, right? The achievement gap, the high school graduation gap, the dropout gap. Sometimes we're at the top, dropout. Sometimes we're at the bottom, high school graduation. But the gap is what persists, and it's a problem. We have to really push back on the stories that we tell. I won't go into it, but those of you who, uh, who want to learn more about kind of the theory behind some of this, one of my favorite uh, volumes a book uh, called To Remain an Indian by Sinead Oromawema and Teresa McCarty a few years ago. And they talk about the policy pendulum in uh, D.C. moving between accepting or rejecting Native culture. And they frame a theory called safety zone theory. Over time, our cultures have been deemed safe or dangerous with respect to the American version of what it means to be American. The, you know, that American is a new nation born there was nothing here before, right? And our, our cultures early on threatened or were dangerous for that vision. Listen to the narratives that are going around now and think about are our cultures going to be framed again as dangerous for building a new America in this context? This is the, the, the work that we have to trace those narratives. Beyond the fatalism and the brokenness is a, a challenge around a distrust of difference. The idea that we all need to build together as same 
is problematic. Thank you so much, April. Both of those um, obstacles are fueled by fear. They're also fueled by separation, this idea of breakdown of relationship. And I often talk about when I was at NCAI, I was brought in to build a, a, a paradigm around research and how to break down the fear that Indian people have with research. Um, and so I did that for the first two years. But then we realized as a team that when you're working within a context of fear, that you can only get so far. So what's the alternative, right? Brace yourself. The alternative is love. Yeah, I said love, fuzzy, fuzzy love, right? And when I first brought this to the Hill in DC and I said to my colleagues, we gotta start talking about love in our policy work, they looked at me like I was crazy. I can't go up on Capitol Hill and start talking to people about love, hope, you know? And I said, why not? We talk about oppression, we talk about stress, we talk about trauma, we talk about violence with ease. And yet the moment we start thinking about talking about love, hope, peace, and joy with our children, we say, no, God forbid, you know? This is our work, is to build a new narrative. It is not the easy choice. Fear is always right here saying, choose me. It's so hard to reach across difference. It's so hard to surround yourself with people who are different from you. It's hard to step up. Yeah, it is hard. That's the work. That's the work of us as educators. That's what we are called to do, to build right relationship together and to push back against a scarcity culture. The idea that I gotta get mine before you get yours, otherwise there's not gonna be enough, right? That's not our values. If we take care of each other, especially the most vulnerable, there will always be enough to go around. That is how I was raised. That is what we have to push back on. So what I'm saying, these are things you know as educators, but the more that we get adept at identifying these narratives that are trying to reframe that discourse, and we push back, that is when we build that community and we begin to, to, to build forward a new dream that way. We begin to know more about ourselves by learning about those who are different from us. Diversity is excellence. Look at our leadership in this country, in your, in your regions. Are they surrounding themselves with people who are different from them in that context? That's one of the things I look for. We must understand the genealogy of our systems of education and ways of knowing. We have to know our history in order to be effective stewards. And we must actively choose love more in our policy and community work every day. So a lot of people go, okay, Amelia, I can go along with you with this. You know, what does that actually look like though? How do we choose love? How do we love more? Which is the framework we've tried to, to build. And one of my uh, elders, one of our first Alaska Native PhDs who's walked on, uh, Anga Yukak Asko Quagley, would say, Malia, we are people of the Arctic. We have particular ways of speaking and learning and stewarding, and our languages are critical here, but we need the people in the South Pacific. We need the people in the Great Lakes to speak their languages and to, to build their traditional foods, to engage with their traditional knowledges, and then we need to be in relationship with each other, right? We don't need them to be like us. We don't want ne necessarily want to be like them, but we need to celebrate our differences and be in right relationship. So I, in, in thinking about his message and his vision. I've been playing with this metaphor of the lighthouse. And I don't know enough about lighthouses, but I'm trying to learn. So if others out there know, but one of the things I've been learning about light is that when you project a, a single beam of light, it goes a certain distance, right? But when you build different lenses and prisms to reflect off of each other, that's how a lighthouse works. And it projects that light even further. So part of our work as educators is to build right relationship to each other, to think about how we reflect goodness and light through each other in that context and figure out how to connect more meaningfully with each other. I don't know if you've looked around at airports where I spend a lot of time or on the streets. People are in their screens, right? This is how we're interacting in a lot of ways. And I know I'm not the first to say it and I won't be the last. Um, and I was gonna do this little exercise with you, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make you do it with me, but it might be something you might consider in uh, other workshops, because you need um, a good space to debrief the exercise. It sounds very simple, but it's a very profound exercise. So I'll tell you about it just quickly. I've used it in two workshops, mostly it was uh, two workshops with women of color. But what you do is you sit, you pick a partner and you sit face to face. And uh, the original exercise was four minutes, but we only used it for one minute, because one minute is long. And the exercise is simply to look at each other, 
not speak and just to be present with the other person. It's an incredibly challenging and powerful experience. And when we did it in a group of women, uh, one, one group that we did it in, I started hearing giggling in one corner. Mm -hmm. These two young women were just giggling and they were, you know, another, the, the weeping started in another corner. And a woman said afterwards, I haven't been seen. I haven't been looked at. And in another, they actually closed their eyes, but they gripped each other's hands. And they said they were present in the only way that they could be. So what I'm suggesting is just that in our education work, in building right relationship, we find new ways to merely be present with each other is a starting place. Another way to love more in these contexts is native to native comparisons. This is where my geek comes out, my data head. So in that gap framework, what we're often comparing is native to non-native, right? Often our white and our East Asian peers. And the gap is what's always there. But in Alaska, we started saying, well, what's going on for native kids in Northwest Alaska? And how does that compare to what's going on for native kids in Southwest and Southeast, where we have more similarities in our culture and language? And we then began to see, wow, Northwest is doing really well at uh, teacher recruitment and retention, whereas Southwest is doing really well at language revitalization. So we began immediately to see strength instead of deficit and roles that different regions had particular strengths to add into this work. So the more that we can do this, we um, uh, at NCI, right before I left, we were starting to work with Kids Count, which produces annual data around uh, children in the US. And we'd been critical of their native data. And they said, well, show us how to do it. And we said, great, let's do it. So we did. We started with four states, and now they're expanding it to 10 that have high native populations. So what's working here in Michigan that we can leverage out to Arizona and vice versa? And how can we push governors in those states to do the right thing when it comes to more Canadian and Alaska native education? Two other quick things that I think we can do in the love more space is shine the light on our systems. So much of education policy has been about what's wrong with our cultures, what's wrong with our families, what's wrong with our kids. That is the genealogy. David Wallace Adams wrote a piece back in the 90s in the Harvard Ed Review that I think is still pertinent today. And I built on it in a piece called The Genealogy of High Stakes Testing, just tracing the genealogy of the narrative that our, our communities aren't effective places for our kids, so we have to remove them and create boarding schools. Our families have low IQs and cannot provide for the early education. So Head Start, actually, which I think does a lot of good work for Indian communities now, but started as an experiment on removing Indian children earlier and earlier from their families who were framed as not able to provide for their early education. And then high stakes. Our kids can't keep pace. They can't take tests like other kids, right? This is the narrative. But we have to shine that light back on our systems that are responsible to provide for our education here. And then lastly, to tell joyful stories of our successes. We don't take a lot of time to encourage and congratulate and celebrate one another. And I am about joy and hope. And I think one of the reasons is this metaphor of crabs in the bucket. I don't know if you've heard of this kind of notion. So I'm from a, a, a crab uh, uh, community. If you put one crab in a bucket, right, it'll get away. You'll lose the crab. If you put two crabs in the bucket, you don't got to worry because each crab will pull the other one down before it gets out. And this idea that in our communities, we, we can do that with each other, with politics, with other kinds of contexts. But I, a wonderful Hawaiian colleague um, who uh, reframed this, he said, you know what, let me tell you about the alamihi crabs in Hawaii, a uh, very particular type of crab. He said, the traditional place for the crab is not in the bucket. It's on the aina, it's on the land. And if we find a way to connect to each other in our places, we can find ways to celebrate our joy in that and hold up a mirror for our children for where they might go next. So that is our work, is to come together as a community across our many places and cultures to set a few big grand goals together to lead our revolution into the next era. So in closing, I'm gonna share with you what my new big grand goal is. I'm very excited and welcome you to dream with me. I'm not wedded to this goal or this dream, but I'm inspired by it. I came across it maybe about three or four weeks ago. And for me, that's how movements get started, right? Is a spark, a spark of inspiration. So, you know, we may as a community not commit to my particular goal, but it might spark others here to enter into that dream time space and move us closer to the vision of communities that we want for our children. 
That's what I hope for you in this conference time in this space is to spark each other's dreams and to dream together. So before I share the actual goal with you, I just need a little bit of context. Um, so I'm no longer at the National Congress of American Indians. It was an amazing five-year journey. I'm a believer that you shouldn't occupy these national positions for more than five years. You need to bring forward the next generation. So they're hopefully going to name the next director here in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I had an opportunity uh, to start work with a corporation. And it might sound like an odd shift. I thought it was an odd shift to go from education and research to business. Uh, it's certainly not my background. But in uh, 1969, oil was discovered on the northern slope of Alaska. I'm not going to get into all the detail with you, but essentially uh, that they had to figure out how to build a pipeline to take that oil that was found down to the refineries, and they had to settle Aboriginal land claim and land title. And so what was passed was the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, or ANCSA, which is a policy that governs our lands. And if you were born uh, December 18th, 1971 or before, you received 100 shares in one of 12 regional corporations that were structured based on uh, traditional land boundaries. Um, I was not born at that time. I'm what you call an afterborn, so I was not an original shareholder, but my grandmother and my mother received 100 shares in our regional corporation. And our leaders chose this corporate model because of what they'd seen in the lower 48 and the reservation kind of context and experience and had a different kind of idea. There's a lot of critiques of it, um, and I have some, some issues, but the dream was that one day our Alaska Native people would run these corporations, and the corporations were designed not just to maximize profits, but actually to inform community development, to uh, take care of the elders, to take care of the children, and to build community infrastructure. Not many communities have got to that, but our village corporation that I work for now um, is one of the most successful. We have uh, uh, an annual uh, revenue of $550 million. It is out of this world. We're essentially the Boeing um, in, an, in a native uh, contract in kind of a context. And so they've hired a few of us who are shareholders who have our PhDs, which my dad says stands for please hire my daughter, PhD, <laughs> um, to come back, you know, us fuzzy education types, um, to take that economic success and turn it into community wellness. No pressure, right? Um, so my boss is a PhD, and she's also a shareholder. Um, they're tribal members. And so that is the work I'm moving forward is to try to figure that out. And so my new big grand goal, uh, we um, experienced a cyber attack at our village. I serve on my tribal council, and we had a ransomware attack. So they basically locked down all of our computer files unless we paid $3,000 to get them back in, in 24 hours. It was out of control. And then our village corporation experienced another cyber attack. A group of uh, um, cyber uh, hackers from Hong Kong stole about, uh, I think it was um, $7 million. It was unreal. We were able to get 85% of that back. But cyber is where my head is at right now. I don't know anything about it, but I know it's a huge area of vulnerability. So my big grand goal is to build the native cyber force get that native cyber force, right? About 20 years ago, historically black colleges and universities set a goal of identifying uh, an industry where there was going to be great development over 20 years, and they identified biomedical research. They started developing African Americans into the biomedical research field, huge partnerships with industry. This is a domain that I think we have particular vulnerability vulnerabilities as tribal governments, as tribal nations, but also at the state level. The governor of Virginia last week at a National Governors Association meeting said the state of Virginia sustained 86 million cyber attacks in one year alone. We have great science and minds and need in this space, but it's also about building our broadband infrastructure. It's about building our science and education uh, leadership. But it's not just about IT and computer science. It's about our health systems. It's about our education systems. It's about our juvenile justice systems and our systems of family economies. So that's one of the big grand goals. I was able to sit and have lunch with the head of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, a good friend, Sarah Eckerhoff, at our RES conference last week in Vegas, the Reservation Economic Summit. First time INSYS had been invited to RES, which is where the native businesses and industries are. And I said, Sarah, this is a little odd, huh? You always have students at your conference. She said, I know, Malia, we just don't con make the connection. So as I'm uh, moving into the business space, that's one of the spaces I want to start talking to folks about. And I want to acknowledge uh, Sault Ste. Marie Tribe. They partnered with NCAI on an NSF grant uh, to, to really assess 
what their data was at a tribal level, and they are building a framework that's going to inform other tribes to begin to map data use. It's really a cutting-edge kind of innovation work. So not only have we always been scientists, we have always been innovators, and we have the potential to lead in this. So to, to really close this time, I just want to say that, you know, at the end of the day, thinking about the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, I'm a dreamer because my grandmother dreamed of me. She dreamed for me, and she shared her dreams with me so that I would have the opportunity to dream forward for my granddaughter. And I uh, had the opportunity to watch a video some of you may have seen on Facebook recently, and I'm going to steal the best parts of it, but I'll acknowledge I encourage you to watch the full video. It's a Sikh woman um, talking about her grandfather's uh, immigration to the United States and the racialization that he experienced and her darkness and fear about raising her son in this American context. And she said, I know a lot of us are feeling heaviness and darkness, but what if this darkness, she says, is not one of the tomb, but it's one of the womb, that we're at the moment of birthing a new sense of possibility, a new movement in this context. How do we get there? She says, what does the midway teach us? To breathe and push, right? That is our work. We push a lot, right? I heard a lot about multiple hats. But don't forget to breathe and encourage each other in this work to breathe and push. There is great hope. People are doing this work across Indian country and beyond. You are not alone in this. And we celebrate and we lift our hands. We raise our hands to you in this. So love more, breathe and push, celebrate, dream big dreams so that we can leave this place a little better than we found it. Kleana Miigwech. All right, miigwech, Malia. Very inspiring words for uh, starting our day and our conference here. And, uh, you know, I uh, know we're a little bit behind in our schedule. Uh, no big deal. We're going to catch up at lunchtime because you guys are just going to have a small lunch. <laughs> so uh, we're going to head out to the uh, sessions now. Uh, for those of you who have not completed your registration, uh, we do have the registration table. Those who are going to the youth track, I need you to go ahead and stand up and head over and see the two young ladies in the doorway there. Uh, they are going to uh, walk with you guys over to the uh, uh, Hedgecock, is it Hedgecock? Hedgecock, and you're going to begin your campus tour. And so I uh, wish you all well, and we'll be uh, rejoining you later on. And so for those of you who are here for the general track, uh, have a great day. Uh, we have a lot of great session presenters lined up for you. Uh, lunch is on your own today. Uh, MIEC folks, I'm uh, going to uh, invite you to have lunch with me uh, in the uh, dining hall upstairs, so uh, if you would. And then we ha do have our business meeting this evening. So miigwech. Everybody have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.